need to tell you how important and pressing this work is. All of you know this from the work that you do in your communities. You know what it feels like when a synagogue or cemetery is desecrated. You know the families who have to comfort their children after a slur is hurled their way online or in real life. You all know college students who are bewildered by the hostility they encounter on campus. On their own, these experiences are incredibly unsettling. But taken together and put them into the big picture of our entire country, as we did in our annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents that we published just last week, and the picture that it paints is absolutely terrifying. Anti-Semitic incidents in 2021 soared to 2,717, a whopping 34% increase over 2020. This was the highest number of anti-Jewish acts that we've ever recorded in the more than four decades that we've been doing this work. Let me put that in some context. After recording the largest total ever in 2019, and then the third highest total in 2020, 2021 now represents the high watermark for anti-Semitism in America. It's arguably reached the highest point since the 1930s. Among the incidents, anti-Jewish assaults were up 167% over the prior year. We saw 88 violent acts that impacted 131 people. We also saw 1,776 acts of harassment and 853 incidents of vandalism. Nearly one in five of these anti-Jewish incidents were connected to known extremist groups, which means that over 80% were committed by otherwise ordinary people. These statistics also include the unprecedented surge in anti-Semitic violence that exploded across America during the conflict between Israel and the terror group Hamas last spring. In fact, during the month of May 2021, ADL logged 387 anti-Jewish acts, an increase of almost 150 percent over the same period of time in 2020, including 15 brazen assaults. Process that for a moment. A nearly 150 percent increase. Now, some might dismiss this number. Well, it was all political, they might say, and brush it off. But here, I'm talking about not just grotesque displays of anti-Israel hate, though that would be enough, but a veritable greatest hits of anti-Semitic rhetoric. Everything from signs claiming that Jews are responsible for killing Jesus to hideous Holocaust analogies to bizarre conspiracies straight out of the Protocols of Zion. And this is the point. To those who still cling to the idea that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, let me clarify this for you as clearly as I can. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism is an ideology rooted in rage. It is predicated on one concept, the negation of another people, a notion as alien to our modern discourse as white supremacy. It requires a willful denial of even a superficial history of Judaism and the vast history of the Jewish people. And when an idea is born out of such shocking intolerance, it leads to, well, shocking acts. I'm sorry, but why would this surprise anyone? Let me give you a recent example. All of us held our collective breath in recent weeks as yet another wave of terror attacks rolled over Israel. Murderous terrorists in cities across the Jewish state targeted anyone within arm's reach police officers, teachers, children. 
And how did organizations like Students for Justice in Palestine or Jewish Voices for Peace, that name is not intended to be ironic, how did they respond? With increasingly dangerous language. Just this month, the Georgetown chapter of SJP invited Mohammed El Kurd to its campus, a man who alleged that Jewish Israelis and Zionists eat the organs of Palestinians, and who claimed that Zionism is inherently linked to, quote, bloodthirsty and violent actions. And in the face of recent violence against Israeli civilians, the SJP chapter in New York, now known as Within Our Lifetime, marched through Midtown Manhattan. They carried signs and chanted slogans. And what did they say? Did they call to stop the violence? No. Did they call to give peace a chance? No. They called to, quote, globalize the intifada. Let me say that one more time. Their response to a surge in homicidal violence against civilians was literally a call for more homicidal violence against civilians. And this isn't the first time SJP and students have called for this. And it's not just SJP. Recently, Jewish Voices for Peace, or JVP, promoted another rally in New York using the hashtag again, globalize the intifada. Now, you might hear from some voices on the fringe that the word intifada is not about a call to violence, that it's about liberation. This is a complete fiction, an utter lie. Even a cursory examination of history reveals that the Intifada was far from a Gandhian campaign of civil disobedience. It was an armed conflict that raged from rocks being thrown at soldiers to suicide bombers detonating themselves inside crowded restaurants full of women and children in Jerusalem. And when activists insist that they don't hate Jews, just quote-unquote Zionists or Zionism. Here's a quick history lesson. The sleight of hand, replacing the word Jews with Zionists to claim some type of perceived moral high ground. That wasn't invented in Berkeley or Brooklyn, but rather in Moscow. It was a rhetorical technique pioneered by Soviet disinformation specialists. You see, Stalinists wanted to claim that their communism inoculated them from anti-Semitism, that their seething hatred of the Jewish people and the systemic anti-Semitism engineered into the Soviet system was about opposition to Western imperialism, that it was rooted in politics, not prejudice, except it wasn't. It was propaganda and prejudice then, and it is propaganda and prejudice now, even if the lies today are repeated by DSA boosters rather than Kremlin supporters. Why do I feel the need to call out these words? Because words have power. Words have meaning. And as ADL fought back when Canada Trump leveled slanders against Mexicans and Muslims in 2015, or when President Trump made the preposterous claim that the 2020 election was rigged and that his supporters should, quote, fight like hell, or when Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene makes horrendous comparisons between COVID-19 mitigation efforts and the Holocaust, as well as embracing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories like QAnon, we speak out and we fight back against such statements because, well, it starts with words. And so when activists knowingly call for violence against another people, that is not normal discourse. That is not reasonable rhetoric. That is extremism. And when campus organizations like SJP interrupt speeches, intimidate speakers, disrupt events, and call for an end to any action that even normalizes relationships or programs associated with Israel or Israelis, 
including calling for the ouster of the local J Street chapter, as happened at Tufts University, my own alma mater last month, I'm sorry, that is extremism. And when a group like JVP tweets, quote, Jews, hands off Al-Aqsa, when they absolutely know that such language is inflammatory, that the community literally is nowhere near the Al-Aqsa mosque, let alone even permitted to pray there, that is extremism. When the SJP chapter in Chicago urges students not to take, and I'm sorry for the language, quote, shitty Zionist classes, because it's taught by two Jewish people, or when a CUNY law SJP-affiliated student demands that Zionist professors not be welcomed on campus and further demands that Zionist students shouldn't be in spaces with Palestinian students because, quote, Zionism is a threat, that is extremism. When the head of the San Francisco branch of the Council on American Islamic Relations or CARE astonishingly claims that ADL, Jewish federations, and Hillel chapters are the enemies of her community. And when she concocts a wild conspiracy of interconnected Jewish organizations that supposedly are planning and plotting to harm Muslims, including the groundless accusation that the Israeli military secretly trains U.S. police to harm people of color, I'm sorry, that is extremism. And when CARE itself takes no action to correct the conspiracism, to acknowledge the hurt of such slander, and instead opts to blame the victim, to defend the bigot, that is extremism. So SJP, JVP, and CARE, these groups epitomize the radical left, the photo inverse of the extreme right that ADL has tracked for decades. Now, unlike their right-wing analogs, these organizations might not have armed themselves or engaged in an insurrection designed to topple our government, but they indisputably and unapologetically and regularly denigrate and dehumanize Jews. And again, I'm not diminishing the singular threat of white nationalists. However, as we saw last May, Vicious rhetoric from elements of the radical left is not just an abstract issue. No, it is dangerous and destabilizing because it can manifest in the real world, because it can impel individuals to act violently. You see, if you demonize another group of people enough, there are more than a few lunatics who will act who think it's okay to slur a classmate during a pickup basketball game, or to deface a synagogue with spray paint, or to jump the Haredi man walking down the street in Brooklyn, or God forbid, do even worse. That's why we're seeing this jump in anti-Semitic incidents, because groups from all sides of the ideological spectrum are using their words to make it okay to hate Jews. As an organization dedicated to stopping the defamation of the Jewish people, it means we must act against the anti-Zionist extremists, just as we have against other extremists, from the white supremacists and the alt-right ilk who murder Jewish people in the places where we pray and continue to pose the greatest threat to the homeland in terms of violent domestic extremism, to religious zealots and Islamist fanatics who spread hate through their own channels and commit acts of violence, let alone inspire others, like a deranged man from the UK who held four people hostage in a synagogue in Texas earlier this year. At ADL, we will continue to combat all of these threats, even as we apply more concentrated energy and amplified intensity toward the threat of radical anti-Zionism. So how will we do that? Well, we'll use our analytic capabilities to expose their ideas and ideology. We'll use our litigation skills to hold them accountable for their harm. 
We'll use our advocacy muscles to push policymakers to take action. And we'll use our communications know-how to share these stories with the world. Now, I can anticipate the reaction by these groups to my remarks. Some immediately will try to delegitimize ADL right out of the box. They'll point to the slanderous drop the ADL campaign that uses innuendo and untruths to libel our organization and assert that we're somehow not a civil rights organization. It's an obvious falsehood, one disproved by more than a century of activism. Some will try to tell us, Jews, what is anti-Semitism and what isn't, and that we shouldn't feel threatened. But this is classic victim blaming. It isn't tolerated when it's done to African Americans or Latinos or LGBTQ Americans, and it shouldn't be tolerated when it's done to Jews. Others will claim that putting these groups in the same category as right-wing extremists somehow makes ADL anti-Muslim or anti-Palestinian. But that is also a lie, one as toxic and as false as the claims by, say, alt-right bigots that calling out their extremism makes ADL anti-Christian or anti-white. And then some, such as JVP, likely will attempt to use their Judaism as a shield. And there undoubtedly are many among their ranks who generally don't intend to be anti-Semitic, who think their activism actually is rooted in their Jewish values. But neither their identity nor their intent relieves these people of responsibility for their actions. Regardless of whatever excuse they give or label they try to use, we at ADL simply will judge them by their record and evaluate them by their actions. And if they spout extremism, we will uncover that hate without hesitation. But even as we remain vigilant to expose our enemies and those who promote prejudice, that is not enough. As much as we fight hate, we also must push for hope. We need to foster communities that are authentically caring and create a country that's welcoming to all. That's why we won't stop advocating for laws and strengthening norms that honor and protect all of individuals, regardless of gender, race, faith, or any other immutable trait. We won't stop speaking out against injustice, whether against Orthodox Jews or the unaffiliated, Ashkenazi or Sephardi or Mizrahi. But we also will not stop speaking out on behalf of all targeted minorities, whether they're Muslims or Mormons, Baha'i or Buddhists, AAPI or the LGBTQ, and anyone who is targeted and victimized because of their identity. As I reflect on the state of security for the Jewish community, I want to underscore our support for federal, state, and local law enforcement professionals who work every single day to protect our institutions and our communities in general. For decades, ADL has been a leading provider of non-governmental data, education, and professional development across all branches of law enforcement. Our investment in this work has helped save lives. And we need to look no further than the horrific hostage crisis in Colleyville, Texas, as evidence that our track record of investment in this work has made an impact. Looking ahead, I want to underscore that while ADL may have some differences with law enforcement agencies on particular policies or practices, we are more committed than ever to acting as a constructive partner, sitting at the table with public safety officials so we can collaborate on solutions to complex problems and support all endangered communities. We'll do so because for ADL, this work is not some faddish pursuit. We didn't need to change our mission to meet the moment. No. Our commitment to solidarity was encoded in the double helix of our DNA when ADL was founded way back in 1913. 
our timeless charter calls on us to, quote, stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. In more than 100 years, those words have never changed. Our founders saw these two aims as two sides of the same coin. Jews could not be safe in America unless everyone was safe. It is all our fight. And you know, almost seven years in, I still believe in this mission. And we must remind our friends and neighbors that yes, we are all in this together, black and white, straight and gay, Jew and Muslim, and on and on and on. We will not be silent. We will not be deterred. We will never be passive in the face of prejudice. So we will thank the administration for allocating funds to secure our synagogues, even as we demand that they also stand up and speak out against all expressions of anti-Semitism, whether it's coming from QAnon or SJP or from the Islamic Republic of Iran, far and away the largest state sponsor of anti-Semitism and terror in the world. Against the backdrop of rising anti-Semitic acts, we will thank the GOP leadership for their statements of support and demand that they call out the bizarre anti-Jewish conspiracies of their candidates and even some of their elected officials. Against that same backdrop, we will applaud Democratic leadership for their statements of support and demand that they call out the statements of those in their own party who knowingly traffic in anti-Zionist tropes and make malicious claims against the Jewish state. And we will ask Fortune 500 employers that are so admirably dedicated to training their employees on diversity, equity, and inclusion, where's the training on anti-Semitism? And we will ask leading colleges and universities that are so commendably focused on protecting BIPOC communities, when will you ensure that your Jewish students have equal protection and when will you discipline those who harass and intimidate them with impunity? We'll demand that tech companies that are investing so heavily to fight copyright violations on their platforms commit the same level of innovation to reducing the reach of hate speech on their services. And let me be clear, that isn't a call for censorship. It's an appeal for decency. Now. This is going to take a lot of work. It may fray some old friendships. It may cost us some donations. But that is the price we must pay for the mission we are on. It is the mountain we must climb. It is the quest that we have no choice but to complete. And we can do so. For decades, ADL has been about fighting hate, but also about seizing hope, about convening people of all persuasions to explore our shared humanity, about helping the African-American community fight the plague of systemic racism, about celebrating the interreligious mix of our country that makes us stronger, about working for immigrants' rights because our diversity is our greatest asset about bringing anti-bias and anti-bullying content into classrooms to educate and empower the next generation, about ensuring that our country continues to live up to its record and fulfill its promise as the most exceptional, open, and vibrant democracy in the history of humanity. So thank you for your dedication to ADL and to this cause because I know that with your help and with your support and with your hard work, we can change hearts, we can change minds, and we can change our country. Thank you.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.